There are a lot of things in life I don't know. And not knowing is the scary part. Like, what's in the deep end? Could be anything. What if there are mangy pirates scouring the land for hidden treasure? Or a gigantic sea monster that's really hungry and wants a snack? But maybe there are pretty mermaids or dolphins that tell funny jokes. I'll never know until I jump. I want to talk to you this morning about movement. Everyone say movement. 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 If you're alive, you move. That's all there is to it. My, my wife and I, we have, we have had a foster. We, we've been doing foster care for a little while now, and it's been a pretty amazing journey. We've had some pretty awesome kids come through, through the doors of our home, and we've got to introduce a lot of these kids to Jesus, and it's been awesome. And, and not all of them have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but we've been able to plant some seeds in some lives, and it's been a pretty awesome journey. But there was a boy that was with us for a time, and... Uh, when, when I became a dad, no one, none of you took the time to explain to me the vomit phenomenon. <laughs> because it never happens in the toilet or the trash can. You know what I'm talking about? It happens in their bed. It happens on the floor and on the couch and in the car. And it happens over and over again. Well, this, we, we had a foster kid who, who didn't know when to stop eating. I mean, he would like stuff his face again and again and again, eat and eat and eat, and he just didn't know when to stop to the point where he would overeat to the point of, of vomiting. Well, one day he was, he was getting really sick, and Katie, being smart and proactive, decided that she was going to do something about it this time. It's not going to happen on the floor. So she took him to the bathroom, and she said, now, now you need to hang your head over the toilet. He stuck his head in the toilet, like his nose inches away from the water. So Katie, Katie directed him out of the, the actual bowl and said, just, just hover, try, try and hover, okay? And then she left because there was another emergency with another boy. She came back, and he had vomited everywhere but the toilet. <laughs> and somehow in the process, it stripped down to his birthday suit. And there he was in his vomit that wasn't in the toilet. And so Katie said, oh, this, this is disgusting. We've got we to clean this up. And I praise, I praise my maker that I wasn't there. I'm not joking. I really, I really did. I, did. I thanked God that night that I wasn't there. And I thank him still that I'm not there. And I'm completely serious about that. And so Katie said, we got to get you in the shower. And so, so Katie starts the shower. And, and she, she, before he gets in the shower, she has him pick up the rug and kind of, you know, dump it in the, the toilet. And then he himself, and, and, and yep, gets in the toilet. Not get in the toilet. He gets in the bathtub. And, and, and he's, the shower is going. And while Katie's cleaning his stuff, Katie starts to hear... And she's, what is going on in there? And she said, ah, it's hitting me. It's hitting me. It's making me move. The water, it's hitting me. I'm dancing. I'm dancing. <laughs> Apparently, he had never taken a shower before. He was moving. He was moving. I remember his first day when he came into the house. Uh, we were watching the movie Home. Some of you have seen Home. And the part in the movie, we're in the car. And he said, my hands are in the air like I just don't care. This is his very first day in the house. And he was standing up dancing. Let me see your moves, guys. Let me see your moves. <laughs> if you're alive, you move. If you're alive, you move. If a church is alive, then it's a church that's on the move. The early church in Acts chapter 2 was a church that was characterized by, by movement. They would preach the word of God and significant things would happen and people would come to faith and life transformation was happening before their eyes. It was an exciting time to be a part of the church. If you're alive, you move. The church was alive and the church was moving. The problem that I've begun to notice today though is that when you say the word movement, people don't think of the church. When you say the word movement, people think of a civil rights movement. Or they, they, think of, they think of the war on terror as a movement. Or they think of the grunge Seattle movement. Or they think of women's suffrage as a movement. Or they'll think of the Underground Railroad and Harriet Tubman and the American Revolution. These are all movements. And most of them were for good and others of them were not for good. And there are other movements in our midst today that are ongoing. But you say the word movement today and no one thinks of the church but that's exactly what it was in Acts chapter 2. It was a movement of these people, of, of, of 12 ordinary guys that God had called to them. One of them was a knucklehead, and Judas did what Judas did, but there were 11. They called another to join them. But in Acts chapter 2, they're in this upper room, and there's about 120 of them gathered together there, and they experience 
the power of the Holy Spirit coming on them, as Jesus had promised they would experience. And when that happened, the church was ignited. But it wasn't the kind of ignition that you and I are familiar with. I light a match, and it'll burn for a little while, but it eventually will burn out because it'll run out of fuel. We'll blow it out before we set it down. I can light a lighter, and I can hold it. I mean, we can pretend like we're at a concert, and there it is. Nope. We're not going to pretend like we're at a concert. But if I hold this down and, and just let this flame burn, eventually it'll run out of fuel. The crazy thing about the church, the thing that Jesus came to establish by pouring his life into 12 ordinary guys, the thing that lived on after, after Jesus ascended back into heaven, is that of all the things that have ever happened in the history of the world, the church is one thing that hasn't come to an end. The Roman Empire that the Jews and the early Christians were living under has come and gone. The Greek Empire has come and gone. The Old Testament, we saw the Babylonian Empire and the Medes and the Persians, those have come and gone. We've seen civilizations come and go. We've seen fads and trends come and go. The age of the mullet is over. So there's some guys who are pretty thankful that togas saw their day come and go. We no longer have to wear a dress. There are some women who are very thankful that the 80s giant bang situation, you know what I'm talking about, has come and gone. World powers have come and gone. Civilizations have come and gone. But the thing that keeps chugging on and on is a thing that Jesus set into motion with his life here on this earth, and it's called the church. Everyone say church. And I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about like church ignited, but I'm talking about like the universal church of, of Christians everywhere believing in Jesus Christ. It's the one thing that, that, that Satan just can't stop. He's tried to stop it. There have been some six, significant persecutions come the way of the church. But let me, let me read this. Our text this morning is in Acts chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, that's where we're going to be. And now that we're in our new building and we have light, you can open up your Bibles and you can actually read along instead of relying on the screen. So I would encourage you to bring your Bibles. And if you don't have one, please stop by Next Steps on your way out. Let us give you a Bible. It's, it's essential to your walk as, as a believer in Jesus Christ that you have a Bible. Also, uh, thank you for your patience with our chairs. We, we were gifted padded chairs. Uh, they're coming from Canada, though. And they won't be here till the end of January, the beginning of February. So in the meantime, I appreciate your patience and um, the sacrifice that your backside is making today. Acts chapter 5. Here's what you need to know. Peter got up and preached in Acts chapter 2, and 3,000 people came to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. They believed and they were baptized. Their numbers went from 120 to 3,120. That's a pretty significant, rapid growth. And then in Acts chapter 3, Peter and John, they, they healed a crippled man. And, and all the people in the synagogue, because this, this man followed Peter and John into the synagogue because it was the time of prayer, they began to look at Peter and John as if by some miracle they had done this of their own accord. And Peter and John, they set the record straight by saying, look, it wasn't us that did this. It was Jesus Christ whom you crucified, that, that, that now reigns as, as Lord and Savior, that it was by his power that this man was made well. And then because of the commotion and the preaching and the teaching, the, the Jewish leaders wanted to know what was going on, a little jealous of the attention, and so they call Peter and John into a court hearing, as it were, of, of the Jewish Sanhedrin. They begin to question them. They're told not to preach in the name of Jesus, but they didn't stop. Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter 5 the apostles continue to preach and they continue to, cheat, to teach and their number grows from 3,000 to 5,000, exponential growth. And God was adding to their numbers daily those who were believing in Christ. It was a pretty exciting time to be alive as a Christian. And then we get, find ourselves in Acts chapter 5. And we're going to start in verse 17. In verse 17, we're going to read through verse 42. This is what it says. Then the high priest and all his associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people the full message of this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts as they had been told, and began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officer did not find them there. And so they went back and reported, we found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain 
of the temple of the temple guard and his chief priests were puzzled, wondering what, could, what would come of this. And then someone came and said, look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people might stone them. Having brought the apostles, they made them appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood, this man being Jesus. Verse 29, Peter and all the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than man. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead whom you had killed by hanging on a tree. God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and savior that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and wanted to put them to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. And then he addressed the men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, Theodos appeared, claiming to be somebody. And about 400 men rallied to him, and he was killed. All his followers were dispersed, and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed, and all of his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. His speech, his speech persuaded them, and they called the apostles in and had them flogged. And then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. Please put verse 39 back up on the screen. This is what I want to focus on today, something that Gamaliel said that he may not have understood the full implications of when he said it, but it's a pretty significant insight. He said, what he's saying, this is the Mark Crest summary of it. He, he said, in essence, if these men are up to something and it's just of their own accord, it'll fail. But if it's God, good luck stopping it. Because you can't stop God's purposes and God's plans. They will not fail. Now, now I want to point out that, that Satan, and that there, there have been some instruments of, of, of some persecution that have existed in and throughout history. In fact, the early church faced some significant opposition. And if this had just been something orchestrated by men because they thought it was just a really super cool, neat idea, then it would have ended pretty quick. Because, because this is just, just some brief history for you. You, you, may, you may find this interesting. The Christians were persecuted to the point of death. It, it, started, it started as a government-wide initiative under the emperor Nero. There was a great fire in all of Rome that was set during his, his stint as emperor over Rome. Many people thought that Nero had set the fire himself because he, they thought that he wanted to rebuild Rome in his own style and rebuild a larger, more magnificent temple. Seizing the opportunity to shift the blame on someone he didn't really care for, Nero blamed the Christians for the start of the fire that burned down a good portion of Rome at that time, casting hate on them. And from that point on, he publicly disgraced these, these people called Christians who were putting their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, so much so that he would have Christians brought to his parties. He would impale them on a pole, and he would light them on fire, and they would serve as torches to light his dinner parties. He would wrap Christians in the garments of, of clothing, raw hides, and they would be ripped to shreds by dogs and wild animals. This is Emperor Nero. That's pretty significant opposition, persecution. And if you're really like, not sure whether or not Jesus was real or not, kind of on the fence about it, that would be a pretty good time to run. But what do we see? We see the church expanding. We see the church growing amidst all of this. Not only him, but there was, there was another emperor named Domitian. Domitian I'm not really sure how to pronounce but that. We're going to go with that. After, after Nero, there was Domitian, and, and he had members of his own family murdered because they had, they had become Christians. They had put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. After him, Marcus Aurelius, who became fairly famous because of the movie Gladiator. Marcus Aurelius was a philosopher. He was a thinker. He was one of the most well-known and well-loved emperors in Roman history. And this is what he had to say about Christianity. He said that it was an absurd, absurd fanatical superstition. 
and he had no use for it. In fact, it was under Marcus Aurelius that Polycarp, an incredible father of the early church, was martyred for his faith. And several other significant Christian men who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and led others to know him. This persecution continued and it kind of rose to its, its peak um, under Decius, the Roman emperor. And he put into law that you would have to sacrifice to Rome and you would have to do it in front of a Roman officer and then you would eat a portion of the sacrifice and then you would be given a certificate granting you clemency Basically saying, hey, you're good to go. Now, you've sacrificed to Rome. You've ate the sacrifice. You can move on and do your thing. And anyone who refused would be put to death. There were many Christians that died as a result of their faith because refusing to worship anyone but the one true God. But in the midst of all of this persecution, hating Christians, killing Christians, the church thrives. You back up a little bit, and it was actually under, under uh, you know, back up to, to Nero, and, and around 70 AD, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed, the place of worship for the Jews, and, and, and where the Christians would gather in, in the courtyards of, of this, this, this temple, and they would gather there for public meetings, and they would disperse and scatter in, into homes throughout for other meetings, but it was the destruction of the temple in 70 AD and widespread persecution of the church, the killing of Christians, the hatred of Christians that caused Christians to disperse all over the world. But the crazy thing is, is they didn't run in fear. They didn't run with their tail tucked between their legs. Instead, they ran and boldly took the message of Jesus Christ with them everywhere they went. And so, so accomplishing what Jesus said in Acts 1-8, that you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the utter ends of the earth. They took the message with them and the church spread. And amidst persecution, it grew. You can't stop this can't even contain this. God started it through this, the birth of his son, Jesus Christ, and he took the time to invest his life into 12 ordinary guys. And after Jesus had died on the cross for the sins of the world, accomplishing salvation for anyone who would put their faith and trust in him, rising from the dead on the third day, defeating death once and for all, assuring us that our salvation is legitimate because, because if we put our faith and trust in the one who could overcome death, then he can also overcome our death, and he can also forgive our sins, and he can give us grace and mercy. After that, he ascended into heaven, and these, these men who had spent time with Jesus went about the work of the church. But the problem in our culture is the church is no longer a movement. The church is something that we'll do when it's convenient. And we'll do church maybe for an hour as kind of an add-on to our life. But the church was never intended to be an add-on. It was intended to be our life. Now, some of us might think that that is, in the words of Marcus Aurelius, an absurd, fanatical superstition that we would do, donate our lives and our time and everything that we do and think and are to the cause of the church of Jesus Christ. But that's exactly what these early church leaders did. They they gave all of themselves to the cause of Jesus Christ. All of themselves to the point of death. And this, this man, Gamaliel, who, who stood up, and he said, leave these men alone, let them go, for if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. Gamaliel's most famous student was a guy named Paul who wrote 13 of the books that exist in our New Testament Bible. Paul was a man who ended up dying for his faith. Weddings, weddings are significant. I, I enjoy marriage. Marriage is pretty awesome. I enjoy being married to my wife, Katie. I think she's pretty awesome. We argue on a daily basis, usually, but there's no one in the world I'd rather argue with more than Katie. We... I love Katie, and she's the love of my life, and she's my best friend, but the more I begin to become a part of weddings, and the more I spend my time with brides and grooms, the more I begin to hate weddings. Before you get up and walk out and claim that I'm a heretic, let me explain why. A wedding in a marriage, this is significant because it's the union of a man and a woman, and when this man and this woman come together, they're pledging their lives together. And, and, and in front of witnesses and, and friends and family, and in, most importantly, in front of God himself, they'll exchange these vows that go something like this. I pledged my life to you for better or for worse, for richer or for poor, in sickness and in health, until death do us part. 
And that's, that's a pretty amazing thing, and, and the love story takes, takes shape, and it moves on from there, and that's how we know marriage. But marriage, is, it actually holds a larger picture for us. The Bible uses the analogy of marriage on a fairly regular basis to explain how Jesus feels about us, the church. You see, you see as, as a husband, I, I pursued my bride, Katie, I pursued her, and we, we did a long-distance dating relationship. We lived four hours apart, and we talked on the phone for hours on end, and twice a month I would, I would drive, and I'd spend time with her, and I pursued her, and I loved her. And my job as a husband is not to stop ever pursuing her, but to get, pursue her all the more, even in the midst of arguments, try to pursue Katie. And this is exactly what Jesus has done for his church. You see, the church is known as the bride of Christ. As a loving husband, we're told to be self-sacrificing for our bride. Jesus Christ was self-sacrificing for his bride, the church. He gave his life for the church. But the reason, the reason I hate some weddings is because of the TV show that has come out and the reality of the TV show. You may have heard of it, Bridezilla. Yeah. Where, where, and I'm, I'm not trying to trash on women and, or anything like that. It's a stressful day. I understand that. But the church begins to operate and look like more like Bridezilla I want it my way. It's, it's my day. It's all about me and things are going to happen on my schedule and I'll be ready when I'm ready. And if they want to start pictures and I'm not ready, they're just going to have to wait. I heard, I heard somebody say that one time. But even more disappointing than that is I see the church do that to our groom, Jesus Christ. Jesus, I'll serve you on my timetable when I'm ready, when it's convenient for me. If, if there's somebody else to do it, with me, then maybe, maybe, maybe I'll consider doing it, but by myself, forget it. No, no, no way, no way. We live a Christianity of convenience. We live a Christianity of comfort, and we weren't called to convenience or even to comfort. We were called to pick up our cross and follow after him, to go all in on this concept called the church. We were called to be bridezilla. We were called to passionately pursue the groom, Jesus Christ, to make him known, to tell the world that there is a groom, there, there is there's a God named Jesus Christ who loves you, who has pursued you, who has gone the distance for you. He died on the cross for your sins, that you would be made right with him. And all the things that you've ever done that, that people know about, and all the things that you've ever done that you hope nobody knows about, he is fully aware of and was fully aware of them when he died on the cross for your sins, and he did it anyway. He went all the way. He went all in on you. It's the job of the church to go all in on him. There's a man named David Kinneman. He is a researcher and an, a statistical anal analyst for the Barna Group. Uh, the Barna Group does research for, on Christian studies, and David Kinneman wrote a book called Unchristian. And in his book, Unchristian, he, he wrote a book about the statistical findings that he found when he did a, a study all across the 50 United States. Uh, and he, he did a study of tens of thousands of people in, each, in, in the 50 states, of both Christians and non-Christians, of the perception of the church today. And what he found was, was this, that 91% of people view the church as anti-homosexual. The 89% view the church today as judgmental. The 87% view the church as hypocritical, 85% as old-fashioned, 78% of people view the church as too political, 75% view it as out of touch with reality, 72% view the church as insensitive to others, and 68% still view the church as boring. And to these people, to these people, I would, I would say probably from where you're sitting, when we, play, when we do part-time church and part-time Christian and, and part-time in, part-time out kind of Christianity at my convenience, then I would say absolutely church is boring. I would say it's probably insensitive to others and probably out of touch with reality and, and all these other things. But, but when I go all in, and, and I've, I've spent a, a four and a half, almost five-year journey of my life where God has been teaching me what it means to go all in on his church, and I realize that there's nothing boring about this. There's nothing boring uh, about looking to the needs of others and setting my feelings and my hurts and anxieties aside. I'm realizing that this isn't about Mark Cress. This is about the purpose of Jesus Christ and his glory being spread. It's not boring. And it's not insensitive. If I go all in on the church, then it's not insensitive to others because if I'm going all in on the church, I'm going all out on myself, realizing it's not about me. 
I'm going to set myself aside and my desires and my priorities because it's not about me. It's about Jesus and his fame and his salvation being made known and his glory and his grace and his forgiveness being known to a, a city that so desperately needs it. And I realize that maybe that seems out of touch with reality to other people, but that's the kind of reality I want to live in where it's not about me. Just, just real quick, this isn't rhetorical. I really want you to raise your hands when I ask this question. And I want you to look around and I want you to see. If you've ever been hurt by the church, can you just raise your hand real quick? Some people have two hands way, way up. Look around, look around. If your hand isn't up, then chances are you haven't been in church long enough. I've been hurt by church to the point of wanting to call it quits. And then God reminded me, Mark, it's not about you. It's not about your feelings. Your feelings are legitimate, but your feelings aren't fact. You can get past them. You can offer forgiveness where it's necessary and seek forgiveness where you ought and move on because this is about my glory. This is about people knowing my forgiveness. This is about people knowing salvation of their souls. It was never about your feelings. If I have been the source of your hurt, let me profoundly apologize. And what I'm about to say isn't a cop-out, but what you need to understand is that as as long as human beings pastor and lead churches, there's going to be hurt. And I I realize that I have never... I have never intentionally hurt anybody, but I do understand and realize that I, on a fairly regular basis, have to surgically remove my foot from my mouth and apologize for hurt that I've caused. But when I go well in in the church, I realize that it's really not all that out of touch with reality. When I get beyond myself, I realize that it's really not all that old-fashioned. In fact, it's probably the most relevant thing going today to love for other people. I mean, who's loving other people the way they ought to be loved? That's really the job of the church. To not work. I mean, that, that was the thing about these early church leaders. They went all in on this idea, so much so that it didn't matter what kind of socioeconomic status you had. If you were hurt, if you were in trouble, if you hadn't met Jesus, they would love you where you were. They didn't matter what people thought of them. If people saw them with these social outcasts, they would love them anyway. And they would point other people toward Jesus. And maybe, maybe the church is too political. But, but, but as, as a church, man, I'm not going to focus on Democrat or Republican. I'm going to focus on God's politics of loving the poor and taking care of the widows and the orphans and making his fame spread. That's God's politics. And if that's too political, then absolutely, I'll do that any day, every day. And as far as 87% of people thinking it's hypocritical, right on, man. Why wasn't that 100%? Of course the church is hypocritical. Because we live one way and then we come to church and pretend to be something else. I came to tell you, I sinned this week, guys. And I've repented of it. Let me tell you where we're going with the rest of this series. I'm going to repent again publicly in front of you. I have publicly said that I think church membership is stupid and out of touch. I've publicly said that. Um, And I I want you to know that I was wrong. Not church membership from the stance that there there are perks and special things for church members. Church membership is a biblical idea. And there's a, a man who I consider to be my pastor, and, and he's here today, he's Glenn, Glenn Davis. He's, he's a man who has pastored me and he's walked alongside me and, and he's, he's shepherded me to, to help better shepherd this church. Church membership is significant, not from the stance of their, you know, being like club perks or anything like that or membership dues. Or, that's not what we're talking about. This isn't a union. This isn't the YMCA. This is the church. And in the early church, church membership existed. Paul talked about the fact that we are one body, but members of one body, but we are many parts. I want to publicly repent of what I have said about that, and change my mind and walk the other direction. At the conclusion of this series, we're going to talk more about why it's a biblical idea and why as a church we ought to do it in the weeks to come, but that's where we're headed. And on the final week of this series, we're going to give each and every one of you an opportunity for the first time in the history of this church to become members of Church Ignited. And we're going to move forward in that direction and we're going to serve God as a body of believers. But this is what we need to understand. So, so the early church leaders, they went all in on the church, but this is how we can go all in on the church in our day, in our age, in our culture. You know what I've noticed is, is that the Bible will sometimes use the family as, 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 unit, as a kind of a, an analogy for the church. So let me continue in that vein of, of family real quick. I've noticed that, that when I go to work 
and Katie goes to work or she's running errands or, and then we drop the boys off of school. But as a family, you know, I've noticed that when we're separated, you know what the crazy thing is? We're all still cresses. We're still family. We're still family. And even though Katie isn't standing up here with me right now and even though my boys are back and kids ignited, I'm, they're still cresses. When we scatter from this place today, you're still the church. And you can be the church and you can live out faith in Jesus Christ by just, by, and it's super simple too, love somebody. Just love them. Right where they are. Whether they love you back, wh- wh- whether they insult you to your face, just love them. No strings attached. Serve them. Go out of your way to be the church for them. Be the church to your family. Husbands, passionately pursue your wife. And as you do that, you're setting an example for your kids of what a husband ought to be and what, what a little girl ought to look for in her future husband. And, and, and what, what they, you're setting a, a picture of what Jesus had done for the church. And as they see that from their daddy, then they're going to grow up and realize, man, that's the kind of God that I want to know. That's the kind of man that I want to be. That's the kind of man I want to marry. Be the church. When, you, when, you're, when you're at Walmart or you're at Dillon's, just let somebody go ahead of you. It's not about you anyway. Serve somebody. If you see somebody stopped on the side of the road, help them. These are the simple things that Jesus would do. People were up in arms about, about refugees coming to America. This isn't a political statement. But what I'm saying, Jesus is bringing people who don't know him to America, a place where people do know him. I don't think Jesus will kick them out. I think he'd hand them a bottle of water and have a conversation with them. But they might kill us. They killed the early church too. It's not a political statement. I'm not here to get crazy political on. I'm just saying, let's just look like Jesus. Let's go all in on his church. As we scatter here and go to lunch, let's just love people. Serve them. Engage with them. Be kind to them. Regardless of their status, of their popularity, of the number of friends they have on Facebook or don't have on Facebook, whether they have a Facebook or not, just love them. Did you know you could love people without Facebook? or Twitter, or Instagram. But you know what's cool is you can love them on there too. The band's gonna come back up and we're gonna wrap this, this message up and we're gonna have a time of, uh, of worship together. But as I've talked about where we're going in this series of going all in on Christ's church, if it's church ignited, fantastic. We want to get you plugged in. We want to get you serving. We want to get you in, in, in a group where you're studying God's word and you're being challenged and held accountable. We want, we want all these things to happen. We want you to grow in your faith in Jesus Christ. That's significant. But if God's not calling you to church ignited, then let us know. That's okay. You're not going to hurt our feelings. We'll help you find the church that God is calling you to plug into and to bloom where you're planted because the significance isn't whether it's us or them. The significance is that Christ's church and his purpose will not fail. You can either fight against God or you can get on board with it and continue to watch him do miraculous things even in our day and in our age.